Hi everyone, welcome back to ENAE 788M. In this class, let's learn how the quadrotor is designed before we fly them. So let's start with the basic components. A quadrotor frame is a rigid material right, that keeps all the electronic components intact. So this is like the main set of things that basically bind all your electronics and everything. It is very essential to choose the right shape, size and the material of the frame. Now let's start to put some components on the quad rotor. So brushless motors, right? Definitely these are the most important components when it comes to the quad rotors. It is very important to choose relevant motors for your quad rotors. So depending on how fast or agile you want the quadro to be, a set of motors should be chosen as it might damage your motors. So note that two of the motors are spinning in clockwise direction whereas the other two are spinning in the anti-clockwise direction. Why is this so? We will learn in the quadro dynamics class. So let's move to a programmable part of the hardware that is the flight controller. A flight controller FC is the heart of a quad rotor and is responsible for controlling almost all the onboard electrical components. This consists of a low power processor and an IMU for attitude estimation. So depending on how your orientation is of the quad rotor, the flight controller sends the command to move in a certain direction. You cannot directly send these commands to the motor, so you need a special type of interference that would be electronic speed controller or ESCs that will basically convert whatever your commands you want to send to RPM level, which is revolution per minute. So let's move on to ESCs. ESCs are very powerful components that connects your controller and your motors. So it takes the signal from your flight controller and power from your battery and makes your motor spin. So each ESCs have a protocol. In this case, you can see BLLES is the protocol, like it can be something, we'll talk about protocol later. And it has some maximum output current, which in this case is 30 ampere, and some input voltage, which in this case is 4 to 4, uh, 2 to 4 cell or 2 to 4 S. So next are the propellers. These are definitely essential to fly a quad rotor. Depending on the shape, size and material obviously, it will generate a certain amount of thrust to lift your quad rotor. Note that since two motors are spinning in opposite direction to one another, the propeller also are directional. So we have two clockwise and two anti-clockwise propellers in a quad rotor. We learn about exactly why and how these propellers are placed in the dynamics class. Next up is the battery. So you definitely need something to power up your quad rotor, right? Which the battery will provide us. So it is the most likely the heaviest component in your setup. For example, if you have like 600 gram of drone, then the battery would weigh about 225 grams. So a few things you need to consider before you choose a battery. They are like total capacity, voltage, current rating, things like that. So your ESCs, if you see that these are ESCs are rated to a specific voltage for a battery, right? So for example, in the previous slide, we saw that ESC is supposed 2 to 4 S or 2 to 4 cell. That means the ESC will only work between 7.4 volts to 14.8 volts. So depending on those ESCs, you will choose the battery. The communication between the quad rotor can be very crucial and it depends on your system and what kind of range you want for the communication. So a receiver or RX goes onto the top of the quad rotor as you can see in the photo. And you have another transmitter or TX which uh, runs with the same protocol. So your transmitter sends a certain set of commands. Let's say you want to rotate your quad rotor on the left hand side or let's say more formally you want to roll your quad rotor in the negative direction then that command will be wirelessly transmitted to your receiver and then the receiver will send those commands to your flight controller. The onboard computer. 
like it is not necessary to use an onboard computer but it is required if you want to make a self-sufficient autonomous quad rotor you can manually control your drone obviously without an onboard computer although to perform any high level operation or command you would need an onboard computer these computer do some sort of computation let's say if you have a camera if you have an optical flow sensor if you have some other sensors you want to detect your environment and act accordingly so these operations cannot be done on a flight controller you need a little powerful processor which runs some sort of an operating system and you basically combine all these information and process that and send some lower level command like in what angle you want to tell you send these commands to your flight controller so now let's see all the components at a glance. So you see we have propellers, ESCs, flight controllers, battery, receiver, transmitter, the frame, brushless motors, and the armored computer. So the question arises is how do we basically choose these components? How do we know what kind of hardware we would need? Depending on a task for which you are using the quad rotor, you will basically choose a sweet set of hardware that matches and performs well together. So a quad rotor frame is the armor for all your sensitive electrical components. It keeps them together. So it is very essential to have a rugged and a durable frame. The frame size in a quad rotor is defined to be the diagonal distance between the opposite models. So if I say that I have a 150 frame, that means the diagonal length of the frame is 150 millimeter. So pico, nano, micro, mini, and standard size are the few sizes that people uh, have talked about in the community and become they have become very common. So depending on the sizes, these frames are made up of different materials. Usually Pico quad rotors are made out of uh, normal PCB boards, which is very light and you can basically use and apply all the components and etch it together. You, you don't have much space, right? So Pico quad rotors made of PCB itself in order to save space and weight. So these frames are not strong, but due to low momentum in Pico quad rotors, the collision impact is generally very weak. So PCB works for Pico quad rotors. For nano or micro quad rotors, carbon fibers are the most common ones and due to its low weight and high strength, it is very important to know that the carbon fiber is an electrically conductive material. Make sure you add some sort of insulation to your electronics before testing anything. So apart from carbon fiber, the next popular frame is high density polyethylene, which is HDPE, it's a very common name, and it's generally used only for standard size quad rotors. So HDP is not as strong, but it's not as brittle as a carbon fiber. So for bigger quad rotors, since the collision impact is too high, the HDPE material undergoes flex, which basically saves the quad rotor. Also, the width of the quad rotor depends on what frame size is and what material is made up of, obviously, and how much weight it can carry and various other factors. So you can see in this slide that you are going from a very tiny quad rotor, which in this case is a Pico quad rotor, all the way to a standard size to a 650 millimeter. And you can see that the amount of sensor or amount of or the size of the propellers and everything is increasing with increase in your size of the quad rotor, right? It is because you want to make your quad rotor autonomous, let's say, considering the 650 quad rotor, you want to make this autonomous, but you can do it because you have enough weight. But if we consider the quad rotor of 80 millimeter, which is the crazy fly, you don't have enough leverage to have enough amount of cameras or a LiDAR system. So moving on to motors. So motors basically consider of two part which is shaft and stator but before that let's understand what brushless motors are it's like what is the main difference between a brushed motors that people have been using from quite a long and brushed and brushless motors so a brush motor has a north pole and a south pole which acts like a magnet right and the system starts rotating but 
what a brushless motor is, it has a three pole system. So exchanging the connection of a, any two wires of the three, it will make your motor to rotate in the opposite direction. Basically, if it was rotating in a clockwise direction and you swapped, let's say two of the wires, then it will start rotating in the anti-clockwise direction. So coming on to brushless motors, it consists of two major parts. One is stator and one is shaft. Stator is the stationary part and the shaft rotates basically and you'll find motors with taller or wider stator right whereas wider stator are more torquey and efficient motors but the wider sta uh, the wider the stator is the more torque can be produced also it is important to know that the torque also depends on the material and how the motors are constructed for example we talked about the stator size right Let's say I change my magnet type, like the quality of magnet or the intensity of the magnetism. If it changes, my torque will change, things like that. And there are things called air gaps in a motor. Like you see the, uh, the gap between the two permanent magnets, they are the air gaps. So the way these air gaps are constrained together, they form a different set of torque. So it is a very, these are the very important factors if you want to like make or buy a motor, right? So how do we choose a motor? motor? So how do we choose a motor? Like quad rotor total weight, definitely very important. How agile the quad rotor do you want? Size of the frame, for example. Like these are three most important factors if you want to consider. So if you know the size of the frame, for example, you can determine the right propeller size for sure. Because let's say if you have a 450 size of a quad rotor, you definitely cannot go more than eight inch of a propeller, right? So using these initial assumption, you can start choosing your motor. So using the weight and the propeller size, you can compute generally how much thrust the motors need in order to lift off and fly the quadcopter. So one important thing to see before choosing this motor is the thrust to weight ratio. So a general rule of thumb is that the motor should be able to provide, provide twice as much thrust as the total weight of the quad. So if the thrust is let's say two less, the quad rotor will not react well to your control. For agile quad rotors or nano quad rotors mostly, the thrust to weight ratio goes to like 10 to one or something like that. So let's, let's say that you have a quad rotor that weighs 500 gram. The net thrust created by all four motors should be about more than one kilogram for a reasonable control. So you can choose a thrust, you can choose uh, a good thrust, uh, thrust bench to measure this thrust. Now let's talk about the numbering convention in a motor. So you see on your right, we have basically two numbers. One is RS2306 and one is 2750 kV. So the first two letters are generally the maker score. So RS stand for racing. This is like a racing set of uh, motors from Emacs. So this basically doesn't matter. The next is the next two elements is in this case two, three, which is the rotor diameter. And the next is zero six, which is the rotor height. And the 2750 kV means how much revolution of the motor are you getting per volt? And then there's an optional thing which are mostly found on a very good motor, which is number of electromagnets and number of permanent magnets in a rotor. So the ESCs or the electronic speed controllers play a very important role in performance of your quad rotor. There are very few basic types of ESCs available right now. Most of them are controlled by an onboard 32-bit processor running the firmware called BL Heli 32. A few years back, they were used to be controlled by a weaker version of 8-bit processor with a commonly used firmware called BL Heli S. So 32-bit can communicate with faster digital protocols as known as like D-Shot 1200 rather than D-Shot 600. 
these are certain set of protocol we won't go through this but if you want to read about it you can read it online so 32 bit can perform tasks like controlling leds which is basic but it can also change the direction of the motor rotation for features like turtle mode so what turtle mode is it's a feature that agile quad rotor used today in order to recover a quad rotor in air from a fit position so let's say your quad rotor is moving like this it for some reason flipped like this there's no way in a normal quad rotor that you can recover it from right so what these can do is they can reverse the direction of how the motor is rotating so let's say your motors were rotating clockwise you can reverse the direction and that can help you to basically recover your quad rotor from a flip position in air so these EACs can go very top end as well, giving information like RPM, how much current is drawn, the temperature of temperature of the flight controller and things like that. Although the features of the 32-bit ESCs are nice addition, the 8-bit ESCs can pretty much do all the job what you want for a quad rotor. Also, these ESC comes with an output current rating, in this case, 30 amps for the 8-bit ESC. This current depends heavily on the motor, propeller, and the weight of the quad rotor. A combination of these factors will draw a certain current I from the ESC. Your ESC must be rated more than that current I. If not, you will fry your ESCs. Furthermore, it is very important to note that it also has input voltage range, which in the 8-bit uh, case is from 2 to 4 s or 2 to 4 cell so make sure you have a suitable battery for that don't don't use 1 s or 5 s batteries to power this ESC either it won't work with 1 s or you are gonna fry the ESC with 5 s also you can buy a 4 in 1 ESC which are much smaller and are usually used for the quad orders like nano and micro scale So choosing the propellers, like how would you choose a propeller for example, right? So choosing a propeller, how would one choose a propeller? So size of these propeller needs to be matched to the rest of the power system. It is very important for that. So for example, if you have a three inch prop on a motor designed for a five inch propeller, it will result in extremely high RPM and the power drawn which will create a very little thrust. Similarly putting large props on a smaller motor will likely be too much for the motor to spin and this will create a very little thrust and lots of heats and excessive current will be drawn. So extreme mismatches can be dangerous and don't use any other motors. Like we'll talk about how to choose motors how to choose an appropriate motor for your quad rotor later. So never like take a motor, like a small motor, let's say, which goes, which is designed for three inch and you put an eight inch prop, it's most likely gonna fry. So choosing your motor depends on these things like size, pitch, design, blade configuration and the material you choose. We'll talk about one by one later. So coming to the naming convention the naming convention generally is like you define length into pitch into number of blades or you just like length pitch into number of blades so in this case this is an 8045 propeller into two that means your 8.0 inch is the diameter or the length of the propeller and 4.5 inch is the pitch of the propeller and two are the number of blades so talking about the propeller size the most important thing to consider when choosing the propellers is most likely the size so depending on your size of the quad rotor motor thrust you require you will choose one single propeller right So the most important thing to choose when choosing a propeller is the size. Depending on the size of your quad rotor, motors and thrust you require, you will choose one. The propeller's size is directly linked to the thrust, responsiveness and the amount of grip the quad rotor will have in there. 
a larger propeller sweeps through more air and therefore takes more energy to get spinning and will respond slower to the inputs from the motor and consume more power whereas if you consider a smaller uh, propeller it will respond faster to the inputs because they have they are sweeping through less air and require less power to change the speed so if you put like a three inch prop for a five inch motor the, <clears throat> the example we had before this is the reason why it's going to be extremely dangerous so mismatches like this can be horrible so coming to the blade configuration what blade, config, blade configuration refers to is the number of blades in the propeller so due to the complicated physics and the fluid dynamics increasing the number of blades is not as efficient as increasing size so a prop with double the number of blades will not perform as well as one twice the size but it does provide more thrust at the cost of slightly more power so less blades are preferable where faster motor response is needed and the thrust is not critical let's talk about propeller pitch so pitch refers to the angle of each of the blades on the propeller so you see all the blades are a little tilted towards one end so this is if it's a lot tilted it's high pitch if it's less tilted it's low pitch so high pitch will usually result in more overall thrust and top end speed but it will have a very less low end torque like it's like driving a car only on the fifth gear so a high pitch propeller will respond to input slowly it will use more power but it will be very efficient when the quadro is moving a low pitch propeller will respond quickly to the inputs and use less power but will only be efficient at low speed just like driving at first or second gear so a low pitch propeller are generally used on a smaller quadrotor whereas high pitch propellers are used on a bigger quadrotor so if you want a very agile quadrotor and a fast moving small quadrotor you will most likely go for low pitch okay let's talk about different kinds of propeller which normally propeller we use it's just called quadrotor propellers and the other one a special type called bull nose propellers so what the concept is you have more surface area in the middle and it's relatively short or the edges are not sharp so the more surface area that a propeller has the more air it can push therefore it therefore it will create more thrust downside is having a high current increased drag and reduced reducing power efficiency but these propeller let's say you have a very small quarter let's say let's talk about quarter to size 130 right you don't have enough space but you want a lot of thrust right so you, let's say you can't go more than like three inch or four inch propellers so what you're gonna do is rather use bull nose propeller of a three inch most likely have more number of blades it will create more thrust but your power efficiency will be less but overall if you have like high amount of weight rather than let's say having a 200 gram quarter you have a 300 gram quarter and if you want enough thrust but you don't care about power efficiency you'll go with the bull nose propeller okay the power supply so talking about the battery which gives you the system the power right you have a lot of components you want to power let's say the flight controller you have the on your onboard computer you have the ESCs and things like that but these cannot the, these don't generally work at the same voltage level right let's let's say your ESC require <coughs> about 11 to 14 volt for example but your <coughs> onboard computer and your flight controller they need 5 volt so it's useless to have <coughs> a separate battery for everyone so you have one battery you have a thing called beck or step up step down can uh, step up step down or a voltage regulator right all these things like they are basically the three different names for the same thing so basically what you want to do is you will input 14.8 volt and that <coughs> the your circuit is gonna give out 5 volt or 9 volt or whatever you want 
So for this, you are basically doing a step down from 14.8 to 5 volts. So talking about batteries, there are basically two different kinds of battery people use nowadays. One is lithium, which is way more common. And the second is nickel, which people are trying to avoid these days. So lithium is lithium polymer or lipo batteries and nickel is uh, nickel metal hydride or NIMH batteries. The way of charging these two are also different. Please make sure it, if you're charging something, you know the difference between these two. So the most obvious difference is obviously the material use lithium versus nickel. But we prefer lithium batteries over nickel, even though nickel ones are less expensive. Why is that so? So the problem is that NIMH batteries are larger and heavier than lithium ion or lipo batteries, which is a major concern if you're talking about the core rotors. So we'll be focusing on lithium batteries in this course. And in general, in the core rotor community, nobody uses nickel batteries. So you can see there's a thing called C rating. Like on the left side of the section, you can see there's a discharge rate of 35C. What does the C mean? So the C rating in the battery is an indicator of the discharge rate of the LiPo. So if you have, let's say a 4S battery with 1300 mAh and rated 35C, that then your safe max current drawn would be 1300 milliamps into 35, where S in 4S means number of cells. It is very important to be aware of these batteries. Sometimes your battery might swell due to some over or under charging rate or something like that. Never ever use these kinds of batteries. So if the battery is a little poofy or swollen, never try to puncture the air or something. It's most likely not the air, it's some chemical leak. Never touch the batteries. Okay, moving on to the sensors. So sensors can be big, can sensors can be very small. So depending on your size of the quad rotors, you have some sort of hardware constraint. For example, you can put a tiny camera, right, on a 130 quad rotor. But if I talk about a LiDAR, which is a sensor and it's about 300 or 400 grams, and the size of the LiDAR is bigger than the frame itself, then you obviously have these set of hardware constraints that you cannot put them on 130 size quad rotor. So depending on what task you have and what size of the quad rotor is, mm -hmm. you have to choose certain size, a certain set of sensors. Some are heavier than the others. So we have imaging sensor, like just the camera or some other sensors. Then you have IMU, which are generally mounted on the flight controller. But if you want some fancy IMU which has much less noise or if you want another IMU to do, detect something else then mounting this is fairly trivial. Then there's a time of flight sensor which basically <coughs> is a laser sensor, sends a beam, get it back, the amount of time it takes, it is basically calculating the distance between them. So if you want to <coughs> calculate the depth from your cord rotor to some wall let's say, these are the sensors to go. And then is the airflow sensor. So this uses Bernoulli principle and <clears throat> depending on what, how fast the air is moving, depending on that velocity, it can measure the pressure of the air. And using this link, you can go through a lot of hardware that might be useful for your quad rotor. So the next step is communication. So we have learned about a lot of components in a quad rotor, but how is this communication being performed from one phase to another? So the first or the most important thing or the starting point is the transmitter, right? So you need something to transfer the values to your receiver. So you will have a transmitter, you will have some set of protocols, let's say, DSM2, DSMX, and FRSky, these are very commonly used protocols, but you can use something else as well. And it will send to the receiver, which is basically using the same protocol. So once the receiver receives that message, that message is again translated to 
some other message and send it to the flight controller. To translate these messages, <coughs> you need to convert these to PWM, PPM, SBUS, MSP protocols like this that the flight controller would understand. And once the flight controller understand, you will send these to the ESCs using some other protocol like one shot, multi shot, D shot and things like that. So these are just the protocol name. You don't have to bother right now with these so much, but using, but learning about these is very essential if you want to build your own quad rotor. And you can also communicate your flight controller with an onboard PC like we discussed before. So these can be done using serial, I2C, UART, and very commonly used in quad rotor called Mavlink. You can have two-way communication between flight controller and onboard PC. So let's say you have a, let's say you have a higher level command, right? You want to send something to the flight controller, receive something to the flight controller. You have to use these certain set of protocols. So let's see everything once again, like you have all these components, right? Like now you understand that how these components are added together and how these quadrotors actually fly. So yeah, that's for the hardware class for now. It will be a little painful in the early days, I believe, with the hardware. Like that's a thing which we have to go through. But once you have you have you are experienced enough, you are going to love your quadrotor. Okay, now you can go and build your own quarter. Have fun.